Well, welcome to the last session, and we, we're going to do our best to make it a lively session worthy of your attention, and I'm sure that it will be. <clears throat> My name is Lou Friedland. I'm a professor here in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and I'm going to be moderating our session today. I'm just going to open uh, quickly with a, uh, following the last session and leading to this one. Some of you know that uh, uh, there's a German philosopher who's uh, uh, and his name is Jürgen Habermas, and I've done work with him for a long time, and people say that I speak, talk about him too much, but this is actually relevant. Um, <laughs> Professor Habermas uh, apparently set up recently a Twitter feed, and he was tweeting, uh, tweeting his philosophy in 140 characters or less, uh, which if you know anything about him, he's an 80-year-old German professor, that's highly unlikely. And it turned out that he'd been Twitter jacked by a Brazilian student who was tweeting in his name. So uh, it just goes to show that uh, it can happen to the best of us. Um, we're really fortunate to have this, this closing panel today. <clears throat> we have two, uh, I have two wonderful uh, uh, panelists, or we have two wonderful panelists with us of the, uh, top, uh, the top of their game in social media. Very briefly, I want to introduce them. Uh, uh, Alfred Hermida is uh, an authority on multimedia journalism. He was a founding member of the BBC News, uh, News.com website, which is widely considered to be one of the, the best in the world at the use of social media. He was news editor there uh, from 1997 to 2001. Um, <clears throat> later, he was technology editor for the website, and he wrote extensively about the intersection of media and technology. He, he comes to us from the University of British Columbia, uh, where he uh, leads the uh, integrated journalism program in the graduate school. And of course, we're indebted to the UBC for our own wonderful colleague, Stephen Ward, who's organized this, this uh, program for us today. Um, our other panelist is uh, uh, Katie Kathleen Culver. Katie Culver. <laughs> Uh, my, my, my friend, my colleague, and, my, and I felt very old think, realizing my former graduate student, or at least. Uh, so uh, Katie, uh, Katie, however, is actually herself a, 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 a widely recognized authority on social media. She joined the School of Journalism and Mass Communication in 1999 after completing her PhD. She teaches what anyone who knows the school uh, is aware of is our anchor course, our bedrock course, 2002. And over the years, it's not only that she's taught that course, which, is, which has helped make the school what it is today, but she's actually systematically <clears throat> introduced our students to social media in that course and in other courses that she's taught. She currently um, is going back and forth on a, a regular basis, uh, teaching new media at the Pointer Institute, which as most of you in the room know, is one of the premier institutions for continuing uh, journalism education in the United States, perhaps the world. So we have two wonderful panelists with us today, and I don't want to uh, 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 spend a lot of time, uh, any more time in intros, but each of them wants to give a brief introductory statement, and then we are going to go into a series of questions. And this is going to be a very interactive session. We all need to jump in uh, uh, and uh, more modeled on uh, uh, a sort of a World Wrestling Federation discussion today than a, a, a highly deliberative one. I want to see everybody involved. So, you want to, you want to begin, Alfred? Uh, okay, in the interest of transparency, I will stay straight away. I'm a digital evangelist, and I believe that Twitter is journalism, so I've put that out there, I've been transparent. I also think I'm right, but you know. <laughs> That's because I used to be a journalist, and journalists always think they're right. Um, I first want to ask you, how many of you have uploaded a photo to Flickr and other photo sharing sites? Okay. How many have uploaded a video to YouTube or another kind of site? How many are on Facebook? How many are on Twitter? You see, this is the world of the internet that we're living in now, one where Essentially, it's participatory and everything is shareable. And I just want to start off by, we've been talking about Twitter and social media, but we haven't really discussed, well, what is it that makes it different from what came before? Um, and I'm going to try to summarize it in the five Cs. So first, we're talking about content. And this is content produced both by professional journalists and by people who are not journalists, 
but may be doing some of the functions that used to be the preserve of journalists when access to the means of production was limited. So we have content. We have convergence. We have a mix of media. A medium that is by its very nature multimedia. It works in text, works in images, works in video, works in sound, works in, in interactivity. It's a medium where the focus is on collaboration. We have the ability to work with others, either directly or indirectly. YouTube is a great example of a collaborative platform. It is not TV, because one of the things you see on YouTube is video responses to other videos. When suddenly video becomes a collaborative experience, which is completely different to the way we watch television. Fourth, we're talking about community. Essentially one where part of the reason you take part in this is to share and to participate, to exchange. And lastly, conversation. What we are then doing is generating a conversation. Now what's interesting is that conversation is something that newspapers have done. You know, Arthur Miller mused in 1961, a good newspaper, I suppose, is a nation talking to itself. Well, the newspaper is still providing that conversation, but now conversations are taking place outside of the constraints of mainstream media. They're happening on YouTube, they're happening on Flickr, they're happening on Twitter, they're happening on blogs, they're happening on newspaper sites. But the difference here is that we no longer, as journalists, control this environment. And I think this is, this is the source of the tension here, that journalism has developed as a proprietary profession where our focus has essentially been on controlling content. We make decisions on what is the news, we make decisions on who to speak to, we make decisions on how to write, how to produce that piece, we make decisions on how long it's going to be, we make decisions on how it gets disseminated. We control the content. When we move to social media, here we're talking a medium where, we're, where the focus is on connecting community. There's still some content, there's still an issue of control, but on the spectrum it is really the focus is on connecting community rather than controlling content. So the tension for the journalist, and for those of us in journalism who study it, who feel passionate about journalism, is where does the journalist fit on this continuum from a profession that it has developed as controlling content, working in social media where the priority is to connect community? Where does the journalist fit on this continuum? And that's some of the issues that we're going to be exploring in this session. Thanks, Alf. Uh, I'll lead off the way that um, Alf led off. I think he's right, too. I think Sue Robinson would probably rather be the third chair up here, <laughs> feeling a little bit more comfortable than she felt in the last, uh, her last noble defense. Um, I guess I, 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 I believe in all five of your C's. I'm having a little bit of a, a, the University of Maryland had a study out this week about social media addiction and undergraduates feeling kind of jittery when they couldn't text. And I'm sort of, as I'm putting his five C's down in my analog medium here, I'm feeling a little like I was still wishing I was live blogging. Um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking and talking and writing about is in this new media world, um, what has, what has happened to challenge our ethics in new ways? You know, Phil Rosenthal, I think, put it very, um, very neatly and, and very accurately when he said, we believe in this. These, these, are, these are values we hold dear. They're not changing with time. But I think one of the things that we are experiencing is that they're more pressured. So I spent a lot of time um, talking with my students, for instance, about the forces that compete with our values. What, what is it that takes us away from our commitment to accuracy, our commitment to verification, our commitment to minimize the harm that we do? What are the pressures that we face and how do new media contribute new dimensions to those pressures? You know, because we can hold values as, as dear as we would like, but when those pressures come, you know, I mean, I value healthy nutrition um, for my kids, but darn, if I'm not under speed and epic economic pressure, if I won't pull off and get a little pack of McDonald's fries for them which I'll probably be doing at the end of this conference today. So, <laughs> so when, we're when we're thinking about the combination of new media and ethics, I think we have to be bringing those questions of pressures, you know, those competing forces um, into our discussion. And we're going to explore three different areas of, of that. So I'll turn it back to Luke. All right. So I'm going to uh, open the first question. We're going to have a little colloquy up here, but then we immediately want to open it up to all of you and all of you in the virtual um, gathering as well. Uh, the first question really is, um, uh, is 
is blurring the right word? Do we actually have a blurring of the personal and the professional when journalists do social media? And if, if so, what questions does that raise for a range of issues that both you've, you've touched on, but also in the previous panel? If, if that world is being blurred, does that really raise questions about what journalism is and, and what uh, verification is? I'm going to start by taking a step back from Twitter to talk about blogs. Because it was, you know, a few years ago, the whole thing was blogging isn't journalism. And you know, I used to go to these conferences and blogging isn't journalism. You're like, blogs are a platform, Twitter's a platform, newspapers are a platform. It's what's in it that's journalism, not the form. So I'm going to go back to blogs. Um, and look at the BBC experience, because I've done some of my research there, and I spent a lot of my professional life there. And I think one of the things with social media is the idea that you will be human. You will be yourself. So the idea that the personality has to be there. When the BBC adopted blogs within news, this could potentially be at odds because at the BBC, you're essentially trained to strip out your personality. You report the news accurately, objectively, and you have almost the corporate voice of the BBC. So you know, when I was a BBC correspondent, people would ask me, did they teach you to be like that? And I thought, well, no, but you just absorb the ethos of the organization. And suddenly you're asking correspondents who have essentially been told, don't be yourself. Be the reporter. Be the correspondent. To say, well, be yourself. Write about your area in a way that's more informal, more conversational, that shows more about your personality. But you've still got to be impartial. You've still got to be accurate. You've still got to hold to these ethical values, ethical principles of our reporting. Um, and what's happened at the BBC with blogs is they have proved remarkably popular with correspondents. Correspondents who have traditionally worked in radio and television have actually taken to blogging, and now there are dozens of reporter blogs. And this is partly because what's, what's happened there is the broadcast reporters have suddenly found that on a blog they're not limited by you have the one minute 15 for your story. You have a platform where you can talk about the story around the story, talk about other issues. And um, in my research, what I found is they don't see the idea of being more personable on the blog as conflicting with their professional ethical values. Because what they say is they behave exactly the same way, they're just communicating with the public in a much more informal and conversational way. And in some ways, what's happened is they've sort of normalized blogging by saying, well, you know, as a TV correspondent, I would stand outside number 10 Downing Street and the anchor would ask me, well, how do you assess Gordon Brown's chances after last night's debate? And the correspondent would give their assessment, their commentary, often in a lively, entertaining way. And what these correspondents have done is taken that practice and transferred it to the blogs. So they don't see the conflict between the personal and the professional because they almost say, this is what we've always done. But what is also happening is, at the same time, they're also pushing the limits of what they can say. Because a lot of this stuff tends to be edited once it gets published. So it'll be either given a cursory look before it's published, or an editor will look at it once it is published. And one of the things we've discussed is speed. So the BBC economics uh, editor, Robert Peston, his blog moves markets. His blog has become the central sort of journalism platform for his work. So when he writes about, I've just heard that this bank is going to be bailed out, and writes three sentences on his blogs almost casually, almost a throwaway, the market moves. And there has been criticism of BBC correspondents for saying, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't just say, I've heard this, and I'll tell you more about it later because that's the issue of sort of speed versus context. So there are tensions there that are still being negotiated. I think another tension is um, in this blurring of personal and professional is the idea of perpetual tasking, as, as I've come to call it in my crazy life. And that is, you know, are, are we now expected as journalists to be always on? Have we surrendered our personal social media life for our professional aim for, but never quite achieving, objectivity. And I think um, there you know, have been a couple of really interesting examples. The Washington Post, for instance, didn't have social media guidelines until their managing editor um, you know, 
tweeted about um, Senator Byrd and the necessity of term limits after he collapsed on um, collapsed in Washington. So I think um, there's a there's a very important question to be asked. When do we get to be off? You know, there are a lot of barriers to encouraging young people to go into journalism right now. And to say, you never get you time. You are 100% journalist, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even on Facebook, is a really interesting pressure to put on people. And I think a, a, a concern that we all have to have. Um, I think there are also times um, where you can make the argument that yes, speed is a, pre a pressure, but if anybody stopped for 30 seconds and, and thought about it, a tweet like Toyota sucks would not go out. <laughs> so so uh, there, there are lots of um, healthy principles, but one of them is could you just think a minute? I, I, I just want to pick up on threads here and, and then open this up. So Alf said that in some sense that the personal is blurring, that in fact journalists like that, and presumably obviously their readers like that too, at least to the extent that they're popular. And Katie was saying, well, there's this always on universe, and I would just maybe, I don't know if you'd accept this, Katie, but essentially journalists are turning their journalism into a personal brand. Why do you have to always be on? Because you always have to be out there. You always have to be engaged in social media. It's almost like instead of a 24-7 news cycle, you have a 24-7 personal cycle. If you're not there when something's happening, then your brand actually suffers. And so is that problematic? I mean, does that, for, for two reasons. For, I mean, we, I think it's true what you, you know, clearly that's the universe we're now living in, but what do we lose from that? And uh, uh, not just the necessity of becoming a personal brand or a branded journalist, but more importantly, the, the reflection. I mean, that's essentially what we do lose, not just the, the well, we lose the, the time, the need to be on all the time, but we also lose the ability to say, wait a minute, I, I, at least I need two hours to stop, sit back and not just verify this, which was raised last panel, that's certainly critical, but we agree there's degrees of verification, but also to say, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the guidelines, I just I want to pick up on that brand concept because I think it's very, very important. And yes, a lot of journalists are developing their own personal brand. But if you look at the guidelines, um, social media guidelines put out, I haven't looked at the BBCs in, in um, the last month, but if you look at New York Times, Washington Post, and NPR, one of the things that's very prominently mentioned is what you put out in your personal social media streams reflects on this organization. So NPR is concerned not so much about the Katie Culver, This American Life blog, our brand, but very much concerned about the NPR brand. And so, so how I feed into that organization or that mother brand, I think, is, is, is of great concern in corporate offices. I do, I do have the sense um, that some bloggers who were early into expressing their personality, developing that brand, Ben Smith from Politico strikes me as one, are, are more comfortable with transparency and letting the audience understand that we're humans beyond just being correspondents and that you know objectivity is not an obtainable goal and I'm not sure the audience wants me to try to attain that goal so I do have a sense that some um, some people who are sort of newer media by training have a different sense of what of what the implications for that brand are for their audience because I find we tell our students you are your own personal brand and that brand exists online, it exists in, in mainstream media, it, it exists in social media. But it doesn't mean that uh, all my students are completely comfortable on social media. In fact, I, I have one who just seems, seems to live and breathe it. She has such a knack for it. It's amazing. It's almost like, you know, what are you really good at? Social media. You know, I don't even have to think about it. I'm a natural at social media, much like somebody would have natural talent doing something else. But to go to um, what Katie was saying, there is, you know, organizations are concerned about what your actions mean to that organization. So at the BBC, for example, there are rules in terms of who you friend on Facebook or what groups you join. So if you join a group that is Labour Party history, is that going to be seen as, oh, you're a supporter of the Labour Party? And is that going to impact on your reporting? It extends to rules on what you retweet. That if you're a BBC correspondent and you retweet a link, while that doesn't, isn't necessarily an endorsement, that it will be seen as, oh, this is valuable because correspondent A has sent it to me. It, it sort of reminds me of the early days of the web, 
of online journalism where we would have links on stories and say these links are not endorsed by the BBC. And we would debate saying, well, we, we, can, we have to link out because that's the nature of the web, but we don't want to say to our readers, we think this is valuable, even though actually what we are saying to our readers is, this is valuable <laughs> by having it there. <laughs> so, so the BBC rules on retweeting are, um, don't retweet because it's seen as an endorsement. Or if you are going to put it in some context, which of course then gets challenging in the 140 characters. And I just wonder whether we're going to get to the same stage, the discussions we had 10 years ago about, oh, we can't link because it's going to be seen as an endorsement. And now we just think, well, linking is just what you do. In five or 10 years' time, we're going to think, well, retweeting is just what you do. It doesn't mean anything. It just means this is kind of interesting. Take a look, much like what Sue said earlier, have the audience make some of those decisions saying, well, we're going to provide you this information and you can be your own editor to try to sort through this. I mean, part of this speaks to, you know, what you said in your opening remarks, Alf, too, that in a conversational model of journalism, and maybe we'll debate whether we ought to have one, but we certainly do have one, um, in a conversational model of journalism, any conversation you say to a friend, hey, look at this, now, when you say, hey, look at this, obviously, you're not just saying, hey, look at this, this isn't interesting. I don't think, you know, I don't think it's useful. You're, you are implicitly endorsing things. And so retweeting and, and even linking in a very, I guess, now low-level background way is a kind of opinion, you know, which, which, again, is an inevitable part of a conversation. So I think when we have one part, we almost inevitably bring in the other, and I think that they're inseparable, uh, for better or worse. Do we have any questions right now or comments? Yes, from the... Not blogosphere. <laughs> Social media is more than blogs. I, I know, Kate. <laughs> Kim? <laughs> so, someone from the digital sphere asked, how many tweets and blog posts are required for a journalist to write a news story about a controversy on the internet? air quotes, without having to actually verify that the story on the internet is true. That was very long. How many tweets How many? could a retweeter tweet if a retweeter <laughs> could <laughs> retweet? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. So much like if you had 10 people telling you something, but they're all just telling you because they heard it from the one person, you would want to verify that. The same practices are here. One of the advantages with something like Twitter is that there is information in the network. So if a message, if certain uh, fragment of news is floating around there and it comes from different sources, you can look and identify who these people are. You can see what they say you know, on their Twitter page, you can see what followers they have, you can see their past history to see what else they've sent. You essentially have the social graph that gives you this added layer of information. So suddenly you're not just judging the tweet on this fragment, but rather on this social information that's around it. The difficulty we have now is that as journalists we don't really have the tools that allow us to do that quickly and easily. If we were trying to verify 20 tweet messages and check out the 20 sources that they came from by looking at their social graph, by looking at what they've retweeted, who they're connected to, are they on Facebook, do they have a blog, that would take a long time. But increasingly I think we're going to see tools that would allow us to mine that information and that would help us give us an additional layer to verify a lot of these details. Right. And with so much of ethics, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that the person is asking the question. It's all about asking ourselves those questions. And I think um, in journalism education, we have an obligation to you guys to get you out in this space and dealing with these sorts of issues. You know, lovely young lady up there just tweeted that I was the one who scared her her quote, um, to Twitter, because I do think it's important for them to be out there and kind of figuring these sorts of things out. I got a Facebook message um, a couple of months ago from a former student, and I think the, the subject line was, hey, here's one question about social media that you never made me think about. I'm now reporting, and a few of my sources are starting to friend me on Facebook. Do I accept? What do you think of that? You're a reporter, you have sources, you're, let's, let's say you're a cops reporter. Chief of Police friends you on Facebook. Do you take it? Do you accept yeah. it? What do you do? So let's have a show of hands. How many would accept the friend's request? Police chief. You're a cops reporter, the police chief friends you. And who wouldn't? Scott 
phone. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> I'm going Socratic. It's because my answer. friends are my friends and my sources are my sources. Uh, you know, if you, you look at Facebook like you would live your life. I mean, I, have a, I do have a Facebook account. I get friend requests all the time from people I don't know, and I ignore them. Uh, if it's somebody that I know and that I want to be friends with, I'll be friends with them. Um, I have sources that I, that I uh, communicate with in, in other ways, but no way. I mean, if, the, if I'm covering the police chief, he's not my friend. He's somebody I'm covering. We actually have a question to the Sorry. other. But, well, before we before you do that, I mean, just to to follow. I mean, there's one issue there, of course, which is our friends actually friends on Facebook. If the if the chief of police friends you, uh, he's presumably sharing a lot of information with you that is actually stuff that's pretty public, or else he wouldn't be friending you in the first place. We actually have a question over here. You want to respond? Yeah. It's new technology, Phil. Is this working? Oh, there we are. <laughs> Freebird. Um, <laughs> I I do I do. Facebook, I, I accept almost every friend unless I think they're, they're spamming me. And, and if somebody, if a PR person starts inviting me to too many events and clogging my account, then they get bounced too. But it's, it's pretty much I accept everybody until they show me that they shouldn't be accepted. But I also treat the account as a public extension of what I'm doing for the paper. So, uh, you know, a friend is cordial, a friend is not a friend. And, and I do not post family photos on my Facebook page. I don't name my wife. I don't, uh, you know, I say I'm married, but I don't name my wife. And, and it's, a, it's a place where we can interact, but it's not a place, I mean, I'm conscious that I'm working when I'm on that site. And to pick up on that, I think it, for some of us, we draw a distinction. I draw a distinction between what I do on Facebook and what I do on Twitter. So Twitter is my sort of public persona. So I, will, I would follow the police chief if I'm covering the crime beat. I would not friend them on Facebook because that is my friends, people I may know socially, and that's very different. And this is partly where we're sort of negotiating what's the personal and professional. I'll give you an example from Australia where the Sydney Morning Herald, their technology writer, on his personal Twitter account made comments about an alleged uh, rape of a woman by a team, by a football team. And he called the woman a slutty groupie on his personal Twitter thing. Mm. Of course, that backfired of him saying, well, if you're a journalist, you shouldn't be saying this. But some of his editors actually, def he's, he, his reaction was, I said that on my personal Twitter account. It's me, it's not me as a journalist. I'm entitled to say I think she's a slutty groupie. And what I found surprising is some of his editors defended him saying, but it's his personal account. He should be allowed to say what he thinks. I think actually you are there as a representative of your organization. Whether you believe it's personal or not, it is public and those comments will be seen as reflective of the organization. Aside from you shouldn't call somebody a slutty groupie anyway. And, and actually the reason, one reason I go on Facebook and use Facebook with sources is it's a back channel way of communicating oftentimes. Yeah. It's a way to get a message to them without calling them at work, without sending them a message into their email account. It goes into a home account or somewhere else and it's just, it's another way to know what's going on. I mean I reported a detail in a story this week based on something I could get from Facebook and nowhere else. So at least we have here two different views of uh disagreement in the room about what a Facebook friend is, what a fa Facebook page is, and what a Twitter feed is. Alf says it is I think it depends. It, 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 it's part it's of business. You, you will make decisions as to what your identity is going to be here. In some ways, there's no right way or wrong way of doing it. If you will want to use your Facebook as part of your profession, an extension of your professional job, then you will make decisions on how much you share. And, and, I, and I think, you know, with slutty groupie or anything else, I think journalists aren't alone in making, these, in making these kinds of decisions. I mean, certainly marketers are thinking about this every day, doctors, attorneys, college professors. I mean, I go to great lengths to try to keep my partisan opinions out of my classroom. 
I'm fairly blown away by the number of my colleagues here and at other universities who are extremely <laughs> partisan in their Twitter feeds, which are followed by students. And I really, I, I wonder what that means. And one of them, you know, sort of takes me to task and says, I am in a lecture hall for 75 minutes on Tuesday, Thursday. And beyond that, I'm me. And I get to have the, the thoughts that I want. And Twitter is a way to, to, uh, to extend those out um, beyond my own brain. Do you want to name names? No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, Herman, to this, is it to this point? Okay, because we have another question on deck. I'm not going to another question. Someone's been waiting patiently, but to this point, we can speak. Thank you. Uh, to quote Phil Rosenthal, being a journalist, <laughs> being a journalist is a lifestyle choice, and as such, as an individual, as a journalist, you are your brand whether you are communicating within the context of traditional media, social media, whatever. Your individual opinion is as much a part of your brand as the quality of your work. So when you have cavalier opinions or you, you treat social media as something else, you are damaging your brand as a journalist. You are damaging the credit, your own credibility as well as that of what you are associated with, and that's just the way it is. So the, the Australian who has a cavalier opinion uh, is damaging his brand as an individual, and I think that's, that's something that, we, that uh, as a journalist we all have to keep in mind. We are our own brand. We, are, we establish our own credibility within the context of ourselves regardless of what medium we are using to spread our content. Okay, um, and now I want to go to the colleague here who's been waiting patiently. Um, I just have a question. I'm a very practical person, and um, I, there are a lot of young people here. I'm a mom. I really can't imagine how much money you would have to pay me to work for a news organization that requires me to be on 24 hours and to sell my brand, whatever that is. Some people here, I think, think a brand is a personality. Me, my brand is just my ethical being. Um, there, there are going to be disagreements about what a brand is. You can, I mean, we can talk about tweets, 140 characters. This is not going to be anything worth talking about in two years. Some, the next new thing will come along. I'm worried about how people will be able to make money in this business. You have to be able to survive. I'm shaking. <laughs> no. well, can I, can I, uh, I agree with you. And I think um, it, it would be interesting if we had a panel of a, a half dozen people, you know, under the age of 40 up here. But um, I, my experience with my current students is they seem ready to be much more flexible and adaptable and in line with, the own, with their own values that they've set for themselves. For instance, I um, had recommended um, a, a student who's now graduated um, for a sort of entry-level job internship kind of job and went to send him a message on Facebook saying, by the way, you know, here, be, this is coming your way and noticed that on his wall was a couple of choice F-bombs had been dropped, not by him, by others who had posted on his wall. And I say in my message, you know, by the way, you might want to clean that off your wall just in case someone comes. And he said, if anybody's not going to give me a job for what's posted on my Facebook wall by some of my friends, that's not an organization that I want to work for. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. He's the kind of person who will say, I reject that I you know, can't have a life outside of this news organization. And so I've found a number of encouraging examples in that regard. There certainly are organizations that are going to expect you to be more buttoned down than others, and you have to make a personal choice about whether you want to do that. I do want to make one, <laughs> one point about the personal brand issue. I, I'm sorry, but you know, slutty groupie doesn't just lower that guy's brand as a journalist, it lowers his brand as a human being, you know, and I'm sort of grateful to Twitter for letting the world know that he's a schmuck, you know, he, I mean, you put it out there and then people recognize you for what you are. 
Lee, you want to jump I, in? And on that note, hey. well, I just want to pick up on that. I think there's a difference in terms of when we think about going online and being online. And what I find, certainly with my students, they, they just are online. For them, you know, being online is not something that they're doing in addition to their lives. It's their lives. Um, plus, I think what we can do with on social media is we can say, I'm going offline. We can say, I'm not blogging for the next two weeks because I'm going to be lying on a beach. And you can actually be far more transparent about this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm not. Sometimes I tweet several times a day when I'm writing. I tweet in the morning. I'm writing by Twitter. See you in a week's time. I wish. So you can actually switch off the network. You are still in control. And it's acceptable to say, I'm switching off for now. Lee, jump in. Um, I think that there's something else that goes on, at least I see with my students, and so I don't want to gotta talk about you guys to your back, so I'm going to talk about you front. Um, I team teach a class with the uh, news director at our public radio station. It's called Tomorrow to More, what smart journalists are listening, reading, and thinking about, or some version. And one of the things we have the students read is a really old magazine piece written by Gloria Steinem. It's probably the one that made her the most famous, called I Was a Playboy Bunny. Um, it's a cool piece for a lot of reasons in this class. Most of these students haven't heard of Gloria Steinem. They have no clue what this piece is about. And every semester they just fall in love. They fall in love with the piece. They fall in love with journalism. They fall in love with her. So far, so great. What they don't get is the hours and hours and hours of interviewing that went into that piece because what they see is it's written in the first person, it's written from first person point of view, and they actually think that's how she collected all of that information. I find that, okay, that's a way of them thinking about the process of doing their journalism that really bothers me, that they can't see the deep, deep work that goes in and they think, oh, this is just her brand, this is just her blog, when it's so far from what it was not. Point well taken. We want to go to the back, and actually, I want to I want to get some comments from the virtual non-face-to-face -face sphere. But I also want to see if any of the UW um, uh, students back there have any comments on these questions. Sure. Um, I'm going to pass along a question actually from the the live blog. Uh, it says, I wonder if a personal brand influences the voice of journalists. Can they report and speak with more authority? How does that influence what comes out in the news? That's a great question. That is a great question. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, one of the things we do at our journalism school is we encourage the students to develop a, specializ a specialization so that they become the person to go to for a particular area. So my student who is a natural in social media is really into music culture, particularly independent Canadian music. So through her brand, through her blog, through her tweets, she basically shares her enthusiasm for Canadian music, her discoveries, her interviews, her professional work, gigs she's going to experience. And that, in a sense, contributes to her identity as if we want you know, to get a young, enthusiastic Canadian journalist to write about Canadian music, she is the person to go to. So I think it can really help to develop your professional brand by, in a sense, revealing more about your personal passions and interests. And I think, it, I, I, I hope I'm getting to the right question here. Um, it seems that maybe there's a sub-question in there about, you know, if we're so worried about our personal brand, will, be, will we be too conservative in what we're putting out there? Will we be always playing it safe and always going for the state, safe story? And while, the, while you might suspect that, if you look at some of the people who have really vibrant, robust followings and, you know, just, just just lots of conversationalism and personality in their own social media brands. You know, David Carr, David Pogue, my two favorite Davids from the New York Times, both, um, you know, well, Carr much edgier than <laughs> Pogue, but both, you know, very much bringing their own personalities into their work and huge robust followings. and. Um, and a lot of great weight to what they're saying, a lot of really interesting content coming out there, so not playing it safe. Um, so I think you, could, you can find some examples probably on either end of the spectrum, and as always, the yeah. truth lies somewhere in the middle. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's a threat to what we're getting in journalism. Okay, I'm going to actually... I just want to give you one quick anecdote to the, the personal and professional, which is there's a BBC correspondent called Rory Kathleen Jones 
started off as traditional broadcasters really embrace social media to the extent that his colleagues have a, po a wanted poster in the office saying, do not approach this man, he may Twitter you. <laughs> but at one point, he, on a Sunday morning, tweeted that he was washing the dog and the dog was looking at him with very sad eyes. And suddenly, people see him this as saying, what are, you know, a BBC correspondent who's paid for the public, why is he tweeting about washing his dog? Well, for one, it was like 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, you know, give him a break, he's not actually working. But also, I actually think there is value in revealing something about your life. In this case, Rory has a dog. He washes it on a Sunday morning. You know, I have a dog, I, have a, I do that on a Sunday morning. It can help you develop that connection with your audience. So I think there is a case for saying sometimes sharing the mundane, sharing the everyday can help you build that connection with the audience. Because what you're saying is, I am like you. I do things you do. And there's no harm in sharing that little aspect and letting you into that aspect of my personal life. OK. I'm going to actually I'm gonna move us on now, because I know that there's a, we could keep on talking about this topic, but I want to move on to a second set of I know that both Katie and Alf spent some time developing some cases of, uh, on issues uh, surrounding news gathering and, and social media, and particularly breaking news. And I'd like to give you a chance to introduce those uh, into the discussion as well. So the, the second area that we wanted, so we wanted to talk about sort of this personal professional blur, but the second area we wanted to talk about was <coughs> using social media in news gathering and some of the cases and problems that that's presented. And um, this, I. I, I became passionately interested in this with a very, very specific moment in time, and that was the massacre at Virginia Tech. In 10 years that I've been doing this and sort of preaching the new media gospel, um, I have never seen my students so appalled by journalistic practice. It was a stunning moment in time because the New York Times, the Washington Post, I'm sure the BBC, um, papers in Virginia linked to the MySpace and Facebook profiles of victims who were killed, who had not set their privacy settings. Words like vulture, predator, I mean, horrible. They were so upset in these ethics discussions. Some of you may have actually been in class at that point. Um, it, was, it was fascinating to me. And as I you know, sort of dug in, I you know, would sort of email a couple of my journalist friends and say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, one in the Washington Post online newsroom at the time said, you know, hey, Jim, my students are really upset that you're linking to these profiles. What do you think of that? And the response comes back, it's public. <laughs> I go to, into my class for the discussion and I say to the student, well, this editor at the Washington Post says it's public. Passionately, they say. It is not. It is out there because there was a, a false assumption made about the privacy that I have in Facebook. N none of these people ever intended that to be seen by a national or international news audience when, when their lives end suddenly. Then I ask another question. You know, well, okay, what's wrong with it ethically? You know, it, so yes, you think that it's, a, it's a, an invasion of privacy, but ethically, what else is wrong with that? And the really fascinating answer that I got back was, it's inaccurate. Facebook isn't me. That's not who I actually am. If I were to die today, um, you couldn't really tell about my life from what's on Facebook. And, it, and I, when I heard that, I sort of dug in and looked at my own and I thought, you know, actually it's true. It's a performance space. You know, I'm sort of more on the fill end. It's a, it's a um, quasi-professional space for me. If you went on to, if you talked to me for three minutes, you will know that I, um, being a working mother is kind of one of the hallmarks of me. My kids really aren't in face my Facebook account very much. They're not, they're not there all that often. So you'd miss that entire element of me. I thought that was really interesting. What a great journalism ethical construct. If you go and look for me in social media, that's inaccurate. That's not who I really am. I just blown away by that. I think what we're seeing is we used to have very clear areas of what was our sort of front stage area, which is you know, the persona we would present at conferences, to colleagues, to work, and our backstage area that we would present at home, to our partners, to our kids, etc. But what happens in social media is some of those backstage areas start moving to front stage. As Katie said, they're not complete representations, but they're far more intimate than we used to have. So when you move on to Facebook, suddenly a lot of the material that would have been backstage 
is front stage and publicly available. And the question then for journalists is, is it ethical to use this material? Is because it, just because it is public, does that mean that we can use it? Um, I was going to talk about the Elliot Spitzer case and the woman who was caught up in that, the call girl, Ashley Alexandra Dupre. You know, as soon as she was identified, she has a MySpace page, she had various other sites, there was tons of pictures over there, and the media really descended and just raided all her social media profiles for content. So we learned all these really intimate details about her. Now, were journalists acting ethically? Well, she did put that material out there. She was trying to get publicity to a certain extent for some aspects of her personality but it does raise issues. And it provoked a discussion at the BBC where the editor of the BBC News website back in 2008 wrote on their editor's blog that just because these pictures are available, it doesn't remove our responsibility to assess the sensitivities in using this. Um, and his point was that the use of an image by the BBC brings that image to a much wider public that was originally intended. That when people post material and share it on social media, they have in mind an intended audience. Who is going to look at that? And I can understand why most people would think, why would a journalist ever look at my Facebook profile? There are hundreds of millions of people on, on Facebook. I have privacy through obscurity. I don't have privacy because I'm guarding my information. My privacy is because only the intended audience who know I'm there are going to get this. I can hide in obscurity, except, of course, that obscurity collapses as soon as that name comes out and is connected to a news event. And in fact, what ha what's happened since then is the BBC has proposed new guidelines on social media where it talks about that, yes, there may be information, video, photos that are publicly available that are on these social media sites but that reuse by the BBC will bring it to a much wider audience. We should consider the impact of our reuse, particularly when in connection with tragic or distressing events. Recognizing that, yes, this material might be public, but actually it wasn't intended publicly by the person posting it there for the media to reuse, and that we as journalists have ethical responsibilities and ethical questions we need to ask ourselves is, what is the impact of us using this material? Does it cause harm? Will it cause distress? And these are, this is a debate, I think, that we'd like to open up to the floor. Middle? Can I just yell it out? If you can. Oh, no, we need it for recording purposes. Thank you. Phil Jeter, Winston-Salem State University. So does the photo do more harm than the person's name? And is it a question of whether it's a tasteful photo or a racy one? I think these are the questions we need to ask ourselves. You know, are we, I'm, I sometimes I'm surprised by the sort of photos I see from friends on Facebook and thinking, well, I would not be happy for pictures like that to be publicly available. You know, we all, go to parties, we all do things that maybe we're happy to share with our friends, but we wouldn't want to see on tomorrow's front pages. And I think the question then becomes is, do we have a good, is, is reuse of this material in the public interest? Does it help, does it add to the story? Does it enhance our journalism? Does it serve the public good? Rather than assuming, because this material on Virginia Tech is on Facebook, we can use it and we don't need to worry about, well, do they really intend to talk of their grief quite so publicly? And I would say, I would also say, do we need to make that decision so immediately? What's the motivation for deciding whether to grab that photo or link to that profile right now? I mean, it, some of the, some of the greatest examples of multimedia journalism that I use um, in teaching and, and trying to coax along other educators, I use um, this great, uh, it's almost an oral history online from um, the um, Minneapolis Star Tribune, 13 seconds in August. It's about the, the Minnesota bridge collapse. And it's remarkable the amount of information that they have up there. And they have in-depth profiles of people who were on the bridge, who died and survived. Um, and it took them a long time, and they, and they rolled it out incrementally. 
they didn't in the moment say, let me go see, you know, Katie Culver is down there. She may or may not have survived. She's on this victim list. Let me see what's public on Facebook and get it out there. That's of such limited value. Of much more value is waiting and doing that historical piece to really explain who I am, to make sure I have the accurate information, that you're not just relying on this one little sliver of social media. And so I, I would add to the questions of, you know, what's the import of the information? I would add, you know, can you wait? Can you find something better? Is there something that will be more worthwhile and add to it? Another angle, can I, can I Make a little segue on that one? One more segue. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you know me, I'm a tangential girl. One thing that I, I would like to explore that, I, to me, all, all of your C's are great, but the, the conversation C is the one that, that, that really is near and dear to my heart, that I think is the great promise of social media and journalism. It's that dialogue. And it was the moment, conversation um, was the root of my finally deciding that Twitter was something worthwhile in my life. Because, you know, I had been on it and I was like, I don't care that you've been for a run and are taking a shower. I could not care less. Like, you know, poof, didn't get it. And then I uh, followed one of our alums who um, works at a TV station in Chicago. And I saw that his Twitter feed was, hey, I'm working on a story um, on the housing bubble today, looking for people um, who, uh, who may be in mortgage crisis. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. How you know he's expanding his source net. You know that's really giving him much greater access to different people. He only had about 200 followers at that point, but you know that's 195 more people than he could have reasonably called in that afternoon. So to me, that was kind of you know, reporters sort of starting conversations. And I love that element of social media. This week we had a really, um, a lot of people were very critical of a tech blogger for the New York Times, Nick Bilton. Anybody read about this with his? his tweet about being off the record. I'm, they've heard about it in the back. <laughs> Nick Bilton put out a tweet. He was talking about um, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. And he said, uh, just had off the, off the record conversation with Facebook employee, asked what Zuckerberg thinks of privacy. Employee says he doesn't believe in it. And people were all up in arms about this. It's an off the record conversation. Why is he tweeting about this? And yes, I, you know, the, 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 all well and good to be questioning that. It ginned up this fantastic conversation on Twitter, um, in blogs. What is on the record? What is off the record? What do we need to assure sources? What's not for attribution? What's on background? It was this amazing conversation that occurred because of social media. I actually want to, uh, Zach is in the back, and I, I, you wanna, I, I want to make one comment before we come to this, which is that <clears throat> A lot of the the back and forth the past few minutes has essentially been, you know, sometimes sometimes Facebook is a private space, sometimes Facebook is a public space, sometimes it's a persona, sometimes tweeting is personal, sometimes tweeting is is actually part of a stream, sometimes it's news and sometimes it's not. And while I don't think that we're going to definitively answer these questions today, although that would be good for the center if we could. <laughs> I want to point out that there's, there's not much discussion in its, of underlying principles here. And that, in fact, what we've had is a lot of cases in which on, we, we've essentially argued both sides of the case. And sometimes it's this and sometimes it's that. Sometimes social media has one effect. Sometimes it has its opposite effect. Now, it may be that we won't get to those principles. But I, I want to just point out that that's a major shift, at minimum, in an ethical universe in which basically now we're basically shifting to a world of empirical case finding as opposed to first principles. And that's a very different ethical universe than the one that we lived in, Zach. Or I should say the virtual sphere. Zach is its proxy. Working. OK. Um, this is a comment from someone who is following on the live blog. And he said, I don't think you can make a straight answer to should you use info posted on Facebook. I once used Facebook when I was doing a news obituary on a soldier killed in Iraq. From the profile, I was able to reach family, friends, and troops serving with him in Iraq. I used it, and the family ended up being quite happy with the piece. I think part of the issue when it comes to social media is how we use it. And I, part of what happened in Virginia Tech is it was seen as journalists coming in rampaging on this private space that was available publicly and then leaving. So it'd be like saying, well, you've left the door to your house open. Let me go in there. Let me get pictures of all the relatives and anything I need, and I'll just leave. And thanks, bye. I've done my job. So I think part of it is there's an expectation on social media to be social. 
That's the point, that it's not there about coming in, rampaging, and then leaving, but actually engaging with those people. And I think the example there is that, you know, that person engaged through Facebook with people connected to this story. It became a conversation. It became a to and fro. And it wasn't just a one-way thing saying, what have you got that I can use for my story? Thanks, bye. I'm on to the next story. Yep. Question over here. Hi, I'm Brian Moon with the Wisconsin Radio Network. I want to go back to the idea of some underlying principles. One thing that I'm kind of hearing that in the dialogue is a cause and effect going on. Uh, the thing with the internet is, in the case of maybe an anonym, anonymous online forum with people using fake handles, they can say whatever they want and there's no effect there. You know, any kind of uh, venomous rhetoric they put out. Whereas, obviously, a journalist is working for a, a legitimate news organization says these types of things and there'll be a certain blowback from that. Um, I want to kind of ask about maybe the, the role of citizen journalists. The one criticism against them is that since they don't work for a certain organization, for example, if I were to say certain things um, on my personal Twitter, it could affect my employment status or the reputation of my news organization I'm employed by, whereas citizen journalists don't necessarily have that. So. Um, it cause and effect obviously tying into what we do in our, our personal space as well. So okay, if you can just address that point, I'd appreciate it. You want to take that? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll reverse the story. You already have reputation and credibility. A citizen journalist has none. They don't have a brand behind them. They, they live and die by the content they produce. So if you are tweeting things that are wrong, that are rumors, that are gossip, that people don't value, you're not going to get any followers. Somebody on a blog, you're not going to get people reading it. So that in that sense, you know, they, anybody who doesn't have a, a media organization behind them doesn't have that reputation and credibility sort of built into your social media presence. You know, you have responsibilities as a journalist, but you also have a tremendous advantage because you are connected to this brand. Whereas if you don't have that connection there, you really are going to be judged by the content you produce. And in some ways, that is a very democratic field because we can easily, you know, unfollowing somebody takes just one click. It's remarkably easy just to say, well, I'm not going to go to that blog anymore. I'm not going to follow that person because they're not supplying me anything that I consider of value. And I, I want to link back to Lou's point about underlying principles and pick up um, I agree on citizen journalism. I want to pick up on the anonymous comments um, mentioned because there's a really interesting case right now. Um, you know, one of the principles as journalists that we try to adhere to is minimizing harm when we can do so without um, jeopardizing an important story, a story in the public interest. Um, I think we have a really interesting case. It's a legal case, but my interest is the intersection of law and ethics. Um, it's a legal case out of Ohio where a judge is now suing the Cleveland Plain Dealer because the newspaper dug into its anonymous comments and um, we, we, you have to register with an email address to post um, anonymous comments and they dug in and found um, a series of posts by, was it Law Miss, I believe, is the, was the handle. Um, uh, but it was a judge. It, was, it linked back to the um, email address of a judge who says they weren't posted by her. It was her daughter, uh, apparently, who now is claiming that she posted all of them. Um, but this case is really ethically troubling for me. Again, coming back to that conversation element, this principle that we're trying to establish trust with our audience and invite them into this dialogue, what does it mean to give someone an assurance that this is that your comments are going to be anonymous and you dig in and you find out who that person is and then and then write a story on it? You know, it's essentially but akin to breaking an off-the-record contract, which can get you into legal trouble, but ethically, look at the harm that you've caused, not just in that relationship with that one person, but all of the other people that you've invited into this conversation. I mean, boy, if I were on um, plaindealer.com, I'd really be concerned about that, that move to sort of dig in and figure out who this is. Over here. Wendy? Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, Bridget Kurtenbach, WQOW News 18 in Eau Claire. Um, just a couple of things. One, um, with Facebook, I know our company, with all of our stations, is kind of looking at possibly having anchors, reporters, have a private Facebook and a 
um, public Facebook. Um, I don't know if you want to address that at all, um, if you've kind of heard about that. Uh, the other thing is, one thing with breaking news in social media that we haven't touched on really is scanner traffic. I know in our newsroom, we do not report on scanner traffic until we can get it verified, but I have seen other competi competing stations report on scanner traffic as though it is news. And, um, you know, we kind of get burned because we look like we don't know that it's happening or that, you know, we didn't break it first. But yet, obviously, we're not going to, to report on it because, as, you know, CNN showed with the egg on their face, that scanner traffic is not very accurate all the time. So mm -hmm. um, It's inaccurate maybe. a lot of the time. Yeah. Right. Because, <laughs> you know, they're just getting their first reports in. Um, one last point. Um, about tweeting while a story is developing. I guess I do tweet during developing stories, and I think people are forgiving if you don't have everything exactly right because they realize it's a developing story, we address it as a developing story, and I don't think it's any different than an anchor on a 24-hour news station like CNN saying, you know, this is a developing story, here's what we're hearing from the scene, because there are a lot of inaccuracies in that as well. Um, I'd, I'd love to address each of those, actually. Um, if, if your news director thinks that um, there can be a professional Facebook and a private Facebook and that will somehow protect your brand and her brand, that's a false dichotomy. It's wrong. <laughs> it's good. You will get sucked in um, by what get, is on that allegedly personal because, you know what, you and I will go up to the study pub after this conference and I'll friend you and, and I friend your personal one that I find and you accept it and boom, now a journalism professor is watching your personal status updates. Um, so I, you know, if, if people think that's a salvation, it's not. <laughs> Just, it's not. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come back to bite you. Um, with scanner traffic, I think that very question actually was part of what drove the Radio TV Digital News Association to look at its social media guidelines and sort of remind, you know, it's something that a lot of newspapers hadn't had to deal with um, because they never had that kind of immediacy. So when print cops reporters were hearing those, um, hearing scanner traffic, they were tweeting more often uh, because they hadn't had that kind of newsroom ethic of, whoa, let's wait because we, we know a lot of this is wrong. Um, so if you look at those guidelines, there's some interesting sort of refresher course on how much of the time scanner traffic is inaccurate. I come back to Scott's earlier point. Something can be inaccurate in the moment and ultimately wrong. And so transparency is good to let your audience know this is what we think we know at this point, but it's limited. It's based on one source. I, I think that's a place where telling people what you think you have and how you think you got and how you got it can be helpful. Right. I agree with Katie on the personal professional. And when you look at things like the social media guidelines from Reuters or NPR, they basically talk your professional and personal are going to overlap. That you cannot keep these separate. The, the distinctions are getting blurred on social media. So, yes, I would not, I'd say no, you have one Facebook profile, that's who you are. Um, but moving on to the idea of, you know, Taking information. Yeah, before you, um, we have a question on this point, and then, uh, then I'm going I'm to toss it back to you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to follow on the, the Cleveland thing. I'm John Smalley from the State Journal here in, in Madison. And the, well, first I would say you two have really, uh, I mean, the laundry list of incredible uh, complex ideas you've unearthed is about longer than I could <laughs> possibly reach. And I have a million questions, but I will, uh, the, the Cleveland thing specifically, wasn't that? The, and the, the whole anonymous commenting thing is is a real uh, another peccadillo. But wasn't that specifically that wasn't there a violation of the of the policy as it stood that sparked them digging in? It wasn't just a random we're going to out this person. Wasn't there something that they had violated and that's what prompted? And it was a relationship between the comments and the judges' cases um, that that gave rise to it. Um, but again. Legally, they may find a nice defense in their terms of service, um, but ethically, the harm done to that conversation, not just between, you know, it's, 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 the old, uh, it's the old capital punishment argument, you know, would you rather let, you know, a few guilty people go free than, than execute an innocent person? Same thing here. How much have you destroyed your relationship with your other commenters um, to get at this one person? I also, um, I'm a little suspicious that um, it, it's, 
it was kind of easy, <laughs> that it was the sort of easiest reporting route to maybe get to this story. I mean, I can't, if, you know, if the, if the point of the piece was that this judge was biased, there are a lot of other ways to find evidence of that bias than just the anonymous comments. And if you think that that should be fair game for reporting, then you should blow it wide open and let your entire audience that's been commenting know that you are now going to be looking at IP addresses, tracing them back to email accounts, tracing comments back to email accounts, because that's what you're doing. And you're not going to do it just for that one. Yeah, it's a, that is a challenging uh, question. The other thing that I, I, you mentioned earlier, one of the bigger sort of global confusions I have about the, the, the quality of the, of the conversations in social media and, and the, you know, the, uh, the necessity. Your point a, a while ago about people saying, well, what's on my Facebook page, that's not me. Uh, we're acknowledging there's a whole lot of artificial constructs that are going on, but then at the same time, we're putting a high value on these conversations that are involving a lot of artificial constructs. And it seems incongruous to me to value the conversations really highly when we're also acknowledging that there's a lot of falsity and, and you know, uh, again, disingenuousness built into it. I would say we're doing that anyway. The way you we relate to each other here is not the way you relate, I relate to my students, or I would relate to my family, or to my friends. We all construct personalities and different personas in different situations. In that sense, we're transferring existing social behaviors online. And, and I, I want to be really careful not to overvalue the conversation. You know, I don't, I don't want to be one of these, you know, sort of, the solution is if everybody has, you know, 100% free speech all the time and we're all engaged in this massive conversation. I, I, no, people put hate speech in, com in anonymous comment sections. Um, people say venomous, libelous, untrue things. I do think that there are some architectural technological solutions, you know, putting the community in power um, and letting them move things up and down, you know, three flags is offensive and something is, is removed from your comments. I mean, I think there are some technological solutions. I'm not going to defend that everything that's posted there is worthwhile, but I do think the conversation itself can have tremendous power and can be very worthwhile and can be a really um, a, a marvelous source of some great journalism, some I, great ideas. I, I've been charged with our convener to start wrapping it up, so I'm going to do yeah. that. I'm going to let uh, oh, we didn't get to our last thing. Katie and Alf <laughs> actually have have a, a last word here. Yeah. Uh, I want to give you just two examples in terms of news dissemination, news gathering, and sort of how ethical practices are changing, and it relates in a bit to you, know, you talked about the scanner idea. Well, during the Mumbai attacks in 2008, the BBC had on its website a page of live updates where they were pu putting material from correspondents, material they were culling from the agencies, and also unverified tweets together, including stuff that later proved was actually false and was a rumor. But they were putting it all together on the same page, which when you think about it, this is the BBC, the most trusted news organization in the world, and yet it is publishing material that it is openly saying, we don't know if this is true, but we're going to tell you about it anyway. And the way the editors there justified it was, they were saying that when you have a breaking news story, when you have something that's moving really quickly, there is a case for monitoring, for selecting, for passing on the information as quickly as we can saying, we haven't verified this, but this is what we know. And in a sense, what you see there happening is the process of journalism being opened up, almost journalism as a practice that is being shared. And you're sharing it not by saying, this is the stuff we already know, this is the stuff we've verified, but this is the material that is floating around out there and you're going to come across anyway. You know, you're going to see this stuff. So we will put it in context of other material that we have verified and published. And their argument was, there's a case to let our audience know what we know as soon as we know it. And I, I would also wrap up with a, a news dissemination piece, because I think there are a lot of ethical questions in news gathering, but news dissemination is also very important to consider. And um, I, I would point to a case that made me very optimistic, um, and that was the, the um, 
oh boy, this is terrible. It doesn't make me optimistic to say that the shootings at Fort Hood it wasn't the case that made me optimistic, but the way some news organizations responded um, in, if you want to talk about time pressure, that was time pressure. Um, so immediate scanner traffic saying that something had happened on this base. They knew it was bad. A few reporters got onto the base before it was locked down, and their only means of communicating was Twitter. And the thing that made me very hopeful was that the, um, the two news organizations that had reporters on the base were putting out their own Twitter feed, but they were not incorporating a pound Fort Hood hashtag from anybody else. They said, we can't vet that. This is what we know, this is where we are, what we're witnessing. So they focused on this, these underlying principles of authority and accuracy and, and said, yes, we know citizen journalism is important, but this is a developing, breaking story, and until we can have a handle on that accuracy, we're not feeding that in here. They, they were covering this breaking news event in a very heated moment, but I thought that was great ethical decision making, a point where you said, these are the principles that we stand by, We've, we're facing this pressure, but we can get out this information in this way. And I think that was a, a, a great example of um, news dissemination. But anyone who thinks that our ethics are not being pressured right now in this news world, uh, or new world, um, they are. They're under constant competition. I mean, we have a, a, one of the most watched startups in news over the last, I don't know, 18 months, two years is an organization um, spinning off of Politico to do local um, DC metropolitan area news. They have decided to name it To Be Determined, tbd.com. <laughs> the very focus of this is we are not looking at journalism as the end product. It is the process of this news as it develops. Um, so if you want any, any indication that things are changing, tbd.com. Yeah. To be determined, indeed. Thank you both uh, for a wonderful uh, closing panel. Thank you. Thank you uh, both. And I think we've had so many ideas thrown at us by these two wonderful people that my brain is just full. <laughs> and uh, I think I, if you just give me a few seconds, I want to... Uh, simply do a few things at the end that need to be done, should be done, morally obli <laughs> moral obligation to do it, and so on. I want to, uh, first of all, uh, s uh, that's okay, I don't need this. Yeah, it's, yeah, there we go. Oh, well, I don't need the slides. Uh, let me just, just say that listening here, I've heard so many good things uh, the, and interesting things. As Lee will tell you, I want to put one more great big fat idea in your little crowded brain right now. And that is, I've been writing a lot lately, as Lee will know, about where journalism ethics is going. And here's where I would say it's going. We are, the conversation you're hearing today, the debate, the discussion, where are we, the cases, do this, do that, maybe not do this, is because we are in the middle of a very difficult transition to a mixed media ethics. This happens to journalism perhaps every 50 years, maybe every century. And what happens is that the paradigm, when it breaks down, and the professional, and, and for various reasons we all know, what happens is we start dividing, and there's, three, there's three, three moments. One, we disagree, and we call it a crisis in ethics. We can't agree on anything, it seems, anymore. Right? Then there's a period of rapprochement. I use the French word. I'm from Canada, right? And rapprochement is where, you know what, those people used to be sticking fingers at each other, saying, you're not a real journalist, you are a real journalist, it's Twitter, it's journalism. All of a sudden we start saying, yeah, that's all fine, but we still need to come together and talk about this. And you know what, maybe, as, as Alf said, maybe even the BBC can find a way to use Twitter on a breaking story and so on. And it's not impossible. People told me five years ago, we'll never have any ethics on the internet because it's totally devoid of ethics. Not true we are developing a sort of rapprochement, very painfully, and so on. And I think we're moving towards a mixed, an integrative, I think five years more, uh, the, the textbooks we teach, the principles we spout, the practices and how we handle them in conversations like this will be completely different. And they will be what I call open ethics. Here's another big fat idea for you. We're moving from closed media or journalism ethics to open ethics which means no longer is media ethics is the closed preserve of professionals. And here, Alf and I are totally in agreement. And what this means, citizens now will have to be involved in forums like this in the future. 
about how do they use the medium. And they are more and more through a global dialogue, not asking to be let in on media ethics anymore by the professions. They're just doing it. There's a global fifth estate out there all over the place talking about media ethics, right? And so we've got a global conversation. We've got, we've got a wrenching of an opening up of, of, of media ethics. And so my idea is that maybe next year's conference or the conference after that we have or three years down the road, even the way this has been formatted today will be entirely different. And it will, we are moving to a citizens-based media ethics and we are going to get the citizens more and more involved. So if, you can, you know, if your head is full now, think about that on the way home. What I want to do is thank, obviously, our sponsors, uh, and this is important. We really need this support, and we welcome more, by the way. Uh, and certainly, uh, the, the School of Journalism, uh, but also uh, WISC TV, uh, Greenline Strategies, um, and, and uh, well, I'm missing one. When, sorry? American Family Insurance. Thank you. I'm getting tired. Uh, but uh, most importantly, I want to thank the individuals who made this possible. There is so much work to this, as anyone who's organized an event like this knows. First of all, I want to thank the moderators, the panelists, and the speakers who have come here. No one is charging me a big, fat speaker fee of $30,000, okay? They've, they, no one has done that, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. You've been wonderful. Uh, yes. And believe you me, some people said, no, I ain't coming. They won it $10,000. I said, yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm sorry, I really have a, a real ethical problem with that. Wendy Swanberg, our all-knowing Uber organizer over here. Uh, somebody called Catherine, no, Katie Culver, and her, don't forget, all these students haven't been charging me $10,000 uh, fees to be here today. Thank you very much back there. And Magna, who I can never pronounce her last name, uh, and Kim uh, for doing everything you've done. How about our photographer, Jake Naughton? He's been great, moving around, taking great shots. He took a course from me last year, so he really deserves you know, a, lot of, a lot of sympathy. Uh, also, the staff at the Fluno and, uh, and, and everyone else, all the tech people back there. Uh, wow, you guys are pros. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, our advisory board, our new center advisory board, many of you have come here like, like Scott, and, and I'm not going to, Jack, Jack was here, and, and I can't name you all, who actually participated, and I'm, I'm relying on you for, to keep us going into the future. Thank you for coming, and I appreciate it. And the last thing I would say, uh, yeah, I am going to try and do this for you, okay? Hang on. All right. This is the last thing I want to say before we can all uh, go home. It's my favorite, favorite slide of all time. There it is. Go Badgers. 